Okay, so hi, Jamimi. Hello. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm good, you know, just another great day uh, and getting ready to discuss Haiti with you, which I'm very excited about. Yeah, yeah. Exciting and, you know, terrifying at the same time, but it's, it's good to talk about Haiti. <laughs> Exciting, terrifying, confusing, all of the all of the good stuff that you hope out of a good conversation. Right. Um, right. So why don't I go ahead and introduce us? So I am Connor Eccles. I am an associate editor here at Blogging Heads. Um, and as our listeners know, I've been producing and sometimes hosting a series of conversations about how international actors view the world. And I'm thrilled to continue that project today with Dr. Jamima Pierre, who is an associate professor at the departments of anthropology and African American studies at UCLA and also an activist with Black Alliance for Peace, where she works on issues related to Haiti. So thank you for joining me, Jamima. Thank you for having me. Yeah. And oh, yeah. And I have to say that the Black Alliance for Peace is Haiti and the Americas because we've expanded to FYI. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Good things every day. Um, <laughs> yeah. Glad to hear. And so, well, let's go ahead and get started. So Haiti has been in the news a lot over the last few weeks with much of the coverage focusing on the fallout from President Jovenel Moise's, uh, well, dramatic assassination in his home last month. And I definitely want to get into that in the conversation. And I also want to talk about the protest movement that we've seen over the past few years. But given that Haiti, I think, is a is a pretty significant blind spot for a lot of Americans, I think that it would be useful if we started with a bit of a wider view of Haitian history. Uh, so to start with what can only be called a difficult question, can you give our listeners a brief rundown of Haitian history? Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> um Whatever, well, it, however you want to do it. No. I don't want to do it. Well, I got to say Haiti is the second independent republic in the Western Hemisphere um, after the U.S., even though people don't want to talk about that much. But 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 the only free independent um, nation um, because the U.S. still had enslavement um, and white and, and uh, brutal white supremacy uh during the Haitian Revolution. So Haiti was the first black republic in the Western Hemisphere in 1804, defeated the, the large, you know, the powerful army of uh, Napoleon, um, Bonaparte Napoleon, the French army at the time. And, and this, you had these formerly enslaved people take control of, of, of the island of, and then declare a nation in full independence and declare itself a black republic. So Haiti has this history. Um, a lot of people would say that's actually the reason why it's still paying for it. But that revolution really struck at the heart of global white supremacy at the time and really made um, these slave owning nations and, and then the Europeans um, really afraid um, for, for what would happen if other blacks revolted um, in the Western hemisphere and elsewhere. So that's the beginning of Haiti's history, and it took a long time. The U.S. did not recognize Haiti until the 1860s, which is right around the time where you have the Civil War and the, end, the, the formal end of, of, of slavery. And then the French um, did not recognize Haiti for a long time and forced Haiti to actually pay an indemnity. Um, it, would, it would continue to challenge. And I have to say, in the War for Independence, Haiti was able to actually defeat also the, the, the British, the Spanish, um, and, and, and the American forces were helping out the French and so on. So this is an incredible revolution. And if you ever have a chance to visit Haiti and you go up to the Citadel, which is uh, a wonder, one of the wonders of the world, um, you'll see, you know, the capturing of, of cannons from the British, from the Spanish, from the French, um, from this, this revolution. So, so, so that's important. The, and the other part that's important is that the Haiti had to, you know, after a while, Haiti was completely isolated. This is a formerly enslaved population that's free in the middle of slavery, um, um, brutal slavery in the Western Hemisphere. Um, it was completely isolated. And, you know, the, the elite, uh, the bourgeois elite that emerges out of the Haitian government um, in the mid-1800s decided to basically, for some of us, sell their soul and agree to pay friends an indemnity, which was basically paying the white French um, slave owners for losing their property, their black people. So basically, Haiti right. had to pay um, black people had to pay for their own um, independence, and and it's the equivalent of at, at this point about you know twenty uh, something, thirty something billion dollars, and Haiti paid wow. that until 1947. There's a resurgence of research 
on this indemnity and, and which families benefited because they were still paying for it long into the 20th century. So that's an important thing. Um, you know, this is a, a big theft, as people will say. Um, if we think about, you know, the, the political and economic position of Haiti um, um, in 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 there. So now the other part that's important to know about Haiti's history is um, the U.S. occupation of Haiti. So uh, for the longest time, you know, U.S. had once U.S. Had recognized Haiti, had a lot of interest in keeping its is having its interest in the Caribbean and basically pushing out the European powers that had so much so much power um, in, in the Western Hemisphere. Um, the other thing I want to say quickly as an aside for people in the U.S. is that there is they have Haiti to thank for the Haitian Revolution for actually the Louisiana Purchase. And you know, you, heard, you learn history, you learn history in the U.S. and you don't realize that the reason the French sold the Louisiana territory at such a cheap price is because it lost its it's it's golden colony um, in the Western Hemisphere, and it's and and the loss of that crushed French hope of actually expanding in the Western Hemisphere, and it's basically Napoleon sold um, that territory to uh, to the U.S. I mean, it's, it wasn't theirs to to sell because Native Americans, sure. <laughs> but 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 they did sell that territory, which actually doubled the size of the U.S. So. It's, is the direct result of the Haitian Revolution that you have these territories that become part of the U.S. So um, all along, the U.S. has very, been very much interested in Haiti. Um, early 18, uh, late 1800s, what you have is Frederick Douglass um, um, was a representative sent to Haiti, um, U.S. representative in Haiti. And the U.S. has been trying to buy this little island at the top of Haiti, Mole St. Nicolas, since forever. In fact, that's where it wanted to establish a, a base. Um, and, and Haitians completely continue to refuse, which is why it ended up taking Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. So that's that's something to know for, for future reference as we talk about the contemporary moment. In 1915, um, the U.S. invaded um, and, and, and occupied Haiti for uh, 14 years. Um, and, and, and part of the... Not, uh, Part of the part, and this is the longest occupation from 1914 to 1935. Um, um, uh, uh, and part of that occupation was ostensibly to protect U.S. life and, and, and property. And what's interesting about it, it, the occupation, the pretext for the occupation was the assassination of the Haitian president in 1915. <laughs> interesting. <laughs> yeah, so the parallels are really um, fascinating, which is why people are afraid that there's right. going to be another intervention. Um, but the other part of that, in the years leading up to the to the U.S. Marines um, invading Haiti, you have the National City Bank of New York actually was becoming increasingly uh, involved in Haiti's financial affairs. They pushed for Haiti's control of Haiti's airports. I mean, I'm not airports, railroads, ports, national banks, the sovereign debt. Um, and it was the city bank officials actually were already calling for U.S. military intervention, which is an important part of the history to know. Mm -hmm. um, and, and even Vice President uh, Farnham wrote a memorandum outlining the strategy for occupation. And so by the time the U.S. actually came and occupied Haiti, the city banks sent a request for U.S. Marines to move $500,000 of Haiti's gold to a reserve in a Wall Street vault. And this, you know, so this is really <laughs> important to think about, you know, the business, the economic um, aspects of intervention. Mm -hmm. So the U.S. were there and what they, and it was a brutal occupation. It was the first time actually the U.S. used aerial bombardment against the opposition um, to its occupation. It bombed villages and cities and killed, and, 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 and killed thousands of, of, of Haitians and, and installed a forced labor, uh, called a, a forced labor regime to build uh, roads and stuff in Haiti. Um, and it, it was a, it was terrible. And they left by building a Haitian army, the gendarmerie, which would then be the bane of Haitian people's existence, a brutal mm -hmm. army, which then, um, which then would be up, you know, brought up again um, during the dictator, uh, Duvalier dictatorship, which was a 29 year dictatorship, uh, fully supported by the U.S. because Duvalier was um, the anti-communist. And I have to link this to Cuba because it was in 1959 that the Duvalier dictatorship took place, in 1959 where you have the Cuban Revolution, right. and the U.S. fully supported the Duvalier regime up until uprising um, pushed them out in 1986, and it was the U.S. and the French that flew them out in you know private jet to France, to exile in France. And then 
later on you would have the you know the end of the the, the, the value dictatorship you have for the first time the rise of a popular movement um against dictatorship and and it took a while and then out of that you have in 1989-1990 the first free elections um in 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 Haiti um and um with they have the rise of the Chambachon Aristide of the Lavalas family. Oh God, sorry, my dog. <laughs> of the Lavalas. <laughs> no of, the, of the Lavalas Dogs family. have featured in many blogging heads conversations. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> of the Lavalas family. Um, it was the first wide scale, you know, um, 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 uh, election that, that was the first time he had all the poor Haitians uh, uh, voting and he, he won a landslide victory against the wishes of the U.S. And I have to say, because this is important, um, against the wishes of the U.S. because the U.S. Uh, favorite puppet candidate, did, they, they were shocked. They, uh, they, they lost and Aristide, you know, the people power brought Aristide. And from the very beginning, mm -hmm. then you had um, a, 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 a U.S. pressure against Aristide, which led after nine months into a CIA back, which is very well documented in the WikiLeaks papers and so on. A CIA backed um, U.S., uh, uh, a CIA backed coup d'etat against Aristide in 1991. Which, but then, would, because of the protests and large numbers of Haitians coming to the U.S., Bill Clinton was forced to reinstate Aristide. But then that led a, a, a long occupation. He led he reinstated Aristide with twenty thousand U.S. Marines, which stayed in Haiti until nineteen ninety nine. So Aristide was brought back in nineteen ninety four, nineteen ninety nine, and then the biggest occupation, which I argue is a continual occupation, happens in two thousand and four, when U.S. special forces landed in Haiti. Um, put Aristide on a plane and flew him to Africa, <laughs> and then uh, and then the UN actually sanctioned this because so you had a U.S. multinational, U.S., France, and Canada led coup d'état, um, um, and then um, and then after that you uh, you have a, a multinational force. They flew out Aristide within the same day. You had thousands of of Canadian um, Canadian um, Canadian, French, and U.S. troops there, and which was then. Um, um, buttressed by the UN, by UN peacekeeping, uh, uh, so-called peacekeeping, because it wasn't peacekeeping for Haitians, from January, uh, from June, June 1st, 2004. And this, to me, is a legacy we're still living now. Uh, the majority of the military of the UN has left, but there's a UN integrated office that makes all the decisions in Haiti right now. Um, and so we call that an ongoing occupation. So I hope that's a long enough, I mean, that's a short enough history. That is a very good summary of the history. And I think if there's one thing that I can identify as the clearest through line there, it's that there has just been absolutely constant foreign intervention, particularly the U.S. intervention in Haiti. Yes, yes. Yeah. And so that's just, that's something that's interesting. And I think it's not something, I mean, part of why I mentioned that Americans don't seem to know as much about Haiti and why I think that's particularly interesting is that I, I think there are really, there are few countries in which the U.S. has had more influence than they've had in Haiti. Like, the U.S. and Haitian history are, are deeply, deeply connected. Yes, very much uh, connected. And people, people don't want to believe that. It's, it's fascinating. It, it's so intertwined. They have so much say um, that, uh, you know, so, for example, people can look up the Ottawa Initiative. This is in, in, in the fall of 2003 where... U.S. representatives, Canadian representatives, and French representatives met at, the, at this resort and, and decided that Aristide, the popular president, of, elected president of Haiti, had to go, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And they decided that in a few months later, you have a coup d'etat. And it, this coup d'etat happens because the U.S. comes in and sends the special forces, put Aristide on a plane, and flies them out. And even when uh, people in the hemisphere, Jamaica offered Aristide asylum, Venezuela offered Aristide asylum, they threatened them with sanctions and all kinds of things. And they said, and the WikiLeaks papers reveal this, they said that they did not want his presence in the Western Hemisphere because they were afraid of what his president meant because he was so popular. And so, but the U.S. has, you know, and, but I think the 2004 occupation and ongoing occupation, the coup d'etat occupation, is really a key moment for us because this is the way you've been able to have the U.S. intervened, and it's not necessarily as a direct op occupation as the 1915, which was brutal. And this one is the you, you basically destroyed the Haitian state. You take over through, you know, um, the comprador bourgeoisie, as we would call them. Through it's almost like a, a, a indirect rule, right? So you 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 cook up elections. So the the, the last elections, Moise is part of this party. 
where the, 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 his predecessor was handpicked and chosen and put in place by the U.S. And so this is an ongoing intertwined relationship that's economic, that's political, that's also cultural that we have to reckon with. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a good opportunity for us to get into the story, the start of the story of how Moise comes to power. Um, and that's one that the U.S. is deeply involved with as well. And, and my understanding of it starts with uh, basically the earthquake, right? So you have the earthquake in 2010 that ends up killing, I believe, hundreds of thousands of Haitians. Americans are familiar with that probably in a somewhat distant way, but it, it was an event that registered very strongly here, even, you know, when, when events like that tend not to for the American audience. And what's really interesting about it is what happened in the aftermath as well, because you start to see so much of what happened and, and this real transformation of, of Haitian politics almost towards this American, uh, I don't know if control is a fair word, but, but under even more American influence. So can you, can you give some of the story of what happened following 2010? Yes. And so, <laughs> so you have, yeah, you have the earthquake January, 2010, January 12, 2010. Um, by 2000, oh, the other thing I wanted to say, so the, the peacekeeping operation, the UN peacekeeping operation, the UN is not a friend to Haiti, according to Haitians, because it's been brutal. A lot of sexual violence, a lot of, you know, children being assaulted. But what the UN did in, in September was bring cholera to Haiti. Mm -hmm. um, and it brought cholera by dumping um, sewage, sewage, you know, it's sewage from its ba one of its bases into one of the main rivers that, you know, that, that provides water, a water source for these villages in the middle of the country, which is disgusting, right? I mean, the mm -hmm. idea that you're pumping sewage in people's, the water that people drink and wash and bathe in, right? Um, and that killed uh, anywhere between 10 and 50,000 people. And we'll never know mm -hmm. because it was in the villages and a lot of times, by the time people could make it to the clinic and hospital, they were dead because cholera is a deadly disease. So, so you have the UN there and you have the, you know, cholera. So in September, in October, cholera is decimating Haiti, but the U.S. is insisting on um, not postponing the election because they did not like the person in charge uh, who was mm -hmm. President Preval. They thought he was too close to Aristide, even though he had completely denounced Aristide, but they thought he wasn't a good enough. They were mad at him because he agreed to do the Petro, Petro Carib. He agreed to Venezuela's Petro Carib uh, uh, project for the Caribbean for cheap oil for development, right? So that's a, we can talk about that later. Sure, we'll so, come back to that. So, so, so then the U.S. pays $38 million um, for, this, for these elections that they insist on. And, um, and so the, OI, the Organization of American States is very much involved in this, right? And, and we can talk about that as well. So they come in and they're supposed to be running these elections. And what happens is they, the first round goes and the, the, the hand-picked person did not make the first round, which was Michel Martelly, who... It was not really a U.S. was not a Haitian citizen, and so part of the thing is one of the discussions with Marta Lee was a guy who was a former, you know, a music star in Haiti, a, a, a Duvalierist, right? He was mm -hmm. a, he supported Duvalier. He was living in Miami. His house was in foreclosure. He was, you know, having all kinds of financial situations, and people were saying he did not even have a Haitian passport. And but they found him, and then days before the elections, he, you know passports show up and <laughs> that, that he's a Haitian citizen. So there's that. But they handpicked him, right? And so then he comes in and he loses the first round. So he loses the first round of the elections. Right. And, and that first round he, also had, um, so he ends up, he comes in third, right? Which He comes put him in, in third. There. And that led, that election had something like 25% turnout, I want to say. It was really... Yeah. It was yeah. very, very low, um, and 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 all the run of candidates received less than the eleven percent of the votes combined. Right, so wow. it was such a low voter turnout, irregularities, and so on. And so, um, so the you know the the U.S. basically said that these uh, the results were fraudulent when their when their favorite candidate did not make it, and the candidate mm -hmm. that they did not want, which was Preval's political party in sight. Um, his name is uh, Claude Celestin, if I remember that correctly. Uh, so then right. they... Uh, Jude Celestin, right? Yeah, Jude Celestin, thank you for, for telling mm -hmm. me. So then 
they about Hillary Clinton leaves the Middle East. This is the, at the moment of the so-called Arab Spring, right? This mm-hmm. is like the spring of 2011, the early 2011. Flies to Haiti and basically threatens um, freezing the threatens Preval, which was the president, with exile. Threatening the the freezing of U.S. visas for elected officials, withholding disaster aid if they don't mm-hmm. if they don't allow Michel Martelly to become um, the second person. Yeah, and that then, might sound conspiratorial, but I'll make sure to include a link that this, we really do have a lot of information about this, that the U.S. put is, some unbelievable pressure. It is, it, it, yeah, not just pressure, it's like, it's gangsterism. Like, just like, think <laughs> about this, like, you know, you fly to another country and you, you know, and so um, people have written about this, you know, uh, uh, there are books about this. Um, in fact, my very first article for the Black Agenda Report was about this, like the fact that, you know, the, 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 the Obama administration sent, and this is the this is Obama's legacy, and I have to say in Haiti is this the the the, the installation of the PHTK, which is the Tet Kale party of which Martelly was part, and so they brought in these runoff elections, and of course the other thing about these elections, they completely not a, they did not allow Famila Valas, which was the biggest political party at the time, and that's Aristide's party, Aristide's party. Yeah. Aristide's party. They did not allow yeah. them to run. Right, so they, so you have the majority of the the, the people's uh, 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 party not participating. So Martelly comes into power with the message, you know, of like Haiti is open for business, which was perfect for 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 what you know the U.S. won in terms of neoliberal policies, opening up the the the, the country to to foreign corporations and so on and so forth. So this is how Martelly comes into power under the full support and and the forcing of his you know of his position onto the Haitian people. And so then Martelly runs, and under him, there's lots of corruption, but it opens up Haiti to all kinds of fleecing. And this is at the time where, you know, it's released that Haiti has tons of minerals, billions of dollars of, 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 of untapped resources, including oil, so on and so forth. And so then, you know, the fight is on who's going to get these contracts for mining, for oil, and so on. And he opens up the, the country. And it's under him that you have this broad-scale corruption. But by the end of his, his, his rule... You know, he was also ruling by decree, refusing to hold elections. It was, you know, and then he handpicks um, uh, uh, Moise, Jovenel Moise, to continue his legacy, right? Mm-hmm. And and so, and even Moise's uh, uh, presidential election was was no one wanted, right? So people were protesting their irregularities and against the organ again the organization of American states, which ran these elections, really caused all kinds of fraudulent. You know, cor- there's all kinds of corruption. And so Moise gets into power against the will of the majority of the people with even lower turnout than Martelly. And that's how um, um, he comes into power. Yeah. And then, and Moise basically follows a lot of what, one of the other interesting things is Moise comes from basically being this completely unknown figure. Um, and suddenly he comes in and, and he's the next president of Haiti after basically no one knowing who he is, right? Exactly, exactly. So no one knew who he was, except that he was handpicked by Martin Lee, and people right. say he was like a, a, a banana, a, a farm, you know, farmer, and so on. But people didn't, people didn't really know. And I mean, the same way that, you know, Martin Lee's campaign was bankrolled by a lot of people in the U.S., um, um, by some of the oligarchy, um, Moise's was also bankrolled. And, and then, so then, this, but, but Moise coming in means that it allowed them to continue stealing money. And, and so part of the thing is they stole, the, the, that political party stole more than $2 billion of that Petro Caribe funds wow. that uh, Venezuela um, had, had you know, agreed with Haiti and a lot of Caribbean countries. I mean, um, and, and I have to explain, should I, should I explain the Petro Caribe funds? It's, it was... Oh, um, that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> what, what, what happens is Petro Caribe was this, you know... Uh, uh, then under Hugo Chavez, that was his policy, you know, one of his good neighbor policies towards um, Caribbean countries. And this is when oil, oil, pri- oil prices were high and Venezuela had a lot of oil. Mm-hmm. And, and so Hugo Chavez, you know, reached out to these Caribbean countries and said, look, the way we can help you is we can provide you oil very cheaply, right? Um, we'll provide you with oil on a 25-year loan where you don't have to pay anything. Um, it's a 1% interest. And so you can sell the oil and use the revenue from the oil for development projects, right? As you can tell, as you imagine, this was completely dangerous for U.S. corporations. 
And they really were upset at Pleval for signing. You know, they, they tried to bully him, and he said no, and he finally signed it in 2007. Uh, they pressured other Caribbean countries to not participate because this would mean, you know, their, the, the oil companies would be losing out. So this, so this was Petro, this was Petro Caribbean. And so the money that they, the, that the Haitian government was saving for development project was completely siphoned off by this, this party, the Michel Martelly party, the oligarchs who got all the contracts, you know, the development contract. We need to talk about the oligarchs making out like bandits after the earthquake. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but, but so then, but then when there's a report that came out in, in, in late 2018 about the scale of corruption of this political party and Moise was, uh, implicated in that because that's how, he, you know, that's what bankrolled his candidacy and president, um, this run for president. Then there were tons of pro protests, you know, in 80, hundreds of thousands of people in the street. Where is the Petro Caribe money? What's going on? Um, and so there are continuous protests from 2018 all through 2019, 2020, and then especially the protests when Moise, you know, the biggest protests against Moise were in 2021 in February, in March, when Moise's term, according to the Constitution and the Haitian Bar Federation, his term was supposed to end February 7, 2021, and he refused to step down. And so then the protests, you know, he was not a popular president. So then the protests just um, got even more uh, 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 insistent. And, and, and this is where you see that who controls Haiti because um, they're, you know, so first, the first thing Biden, the first policy, the first thing, first statement Joe Biden made about um, Haiti was that Joe Bill Moise would carry out his term until 2022. Right. right. So you have that. And then you have the Organization of American States saying the same thing. And then the core group, which I have to tell people, you know, that comes out of, which is why we say Haiti's under occupation. The core group is, is a, is a convening of, 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 of members of Canada, France. It's a group made up of representatives from Canada, France, Germany, Spain, the U.S., the European Union, the Organization of American State, that basically determine what goes on in Haiti. So whenever the core group releases a statement, they, you know, this is, this is the law. So it's a group of people, uh, of, of non-Haitians and white people that actually run, run Haiti. So the core mm -hmm. group also affirmed Moise's position. And so they're the ones that kept them in power. Right. Right. And so, and I want to come back to the protests and Moise and kind of getting up to his assassination as well. But, and, and this is a related question, but I just wanted to pause and ask just how do, given these history, how do the Haitian people view the international community and view the U.S.? Is it overwhelmingly negative? Are there people that, you know, I'm sure that there's some contingent that benefits from that kind of like, what's the, the benefits from U.S. interference? I guess, what's the, what's the ideological landscape? Uh, well, yeah, the ideological landscape is, is, as, is as complex, you know, it's complex and it's not, right? So the majority sure. of the people think the U.S. is an imperial power. They don't like the core group. So for example, during the protests, uh, against Moise in the late 19, 2019, there are all these messages. Like, if you look at the media, was, you know, the message was like, no more foreign military occupation, no more foreign meddling. Um, they call the core group, um, they, they, they call the core group criminals. Um, they said, you know, they, they call them the core gang. They say those are the real gangs running Haiti. Um, and so, you know, and they, they, they call MINISTA, which was the acronym of the UN Peacekeeping Corps. Um, you know, there are all these signs, even if you go around Haiti, hey, Minnesota equals cholera, right? And so, so part of that is, part of that is people know, Haitian people know, and even now after the, the, the assassination, the main message that's coming across the political uh, spectrum in Haiti is no intervention. They don't want troops. They're tired of these foreigners. And, you know, Haiti has been under occupation since 2004. Things have not gotten better, right? <laughs> you know, the reality is, yeah. You have spent billions of dollars for a UN occupation and you still don't have roads and you still don't have electricity. You have, you know, you've done this. And so part of that is people know that the U.S. is meddling. And, and I have to say, though, what's happened, um, and I don't know if we want to come up to the president after the assassination, but one of the things that, that you know, so, so, so you have that. You have the majority of people know that the U.S. is meddling uh, and so on. You also have, you know, a lot of this would not happen without two other groups, which are the oligarchy, which are the non-black oligarchy in Haiti, which is a, mm. which is an interesting group uh, of people of, you know, Libyans, Italians, French, these 10 to 12 families who own the ports, 
which is why you have all these guns running around the country, you know, so you have all these, all this stuff happening and, and who benefit from major contracts, uh, you know, that are given to them and so on. But you also have the compadre bourgeoisie who I call self-hating because, you know, that you, you, it's like, you know, if you think about African societies, you need these, you need these to actually, you know, do the bidding of, of, of the imperial the imperial countries, you know, in Haiti. So you have the few hand pe- people that are of use at some point until they get thrown out away, like Moise was thrown away, and and, and so right. on. And, and so yeah, so so part of that is so you have the the the, the latest co- government that was installed by the U.S. and the core group asking for U.S. security help <laughs> when it had, the, most of the Haitian people were saying no, we don't want that. And so that so we do have a. And what was interesting too was that for once, and I'm not exactly sure what this means in the greater historical context, but the U.S. actually said no. <laughs> Which they said unusual. no, but yeah, they said no publicly. At the same time, you know, um, they sent a high power delegation that same mm-hmm. weekend to convince the guy Paul Joseph who declared, declared that he was prime minister. Um, right. You know, running the country, they convinced him to step down and put in Ayo Henri. Um, as prime minister, this is the high powered Biden delegation. And then mm-hmm. Biden released a statement that said that they would help Haiti with security to deal with the gangs and then to deal with the elections. And so there, you know, this is, this is setting up. And then you have Ariel Henry just as recently as yesterday asking for that kind of intervention. So yeah. there's, it's making it seem like they're not, they're not interested, but at the same time, they're setting up this space to say, well, the Haitians called us and asked us for help. Mm. Interesting. It is very interesting. And I think I, it is helpful to see. So, so in your view, the, basically the most of the masses of Haiti hold a negative view of outside interference and want to kind of push it out. But then you've got this, I guess, landed elite, um, that is holding a lot of the power that wants the U.S. to continue interfering significantly in Haitian politics because it benefits them personally. Yes. Well, right. the, the, but the, within the elite, though, you have two groups. You have the 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 the, uh, the commercial elite, the oligarchy, mm. which is non-black, right? And and we have mm. to because so Haiti is ninety nine percent black, and so but you have an oligarchy of like Levantine and white people running all the businesses, having all the contracts, you know, the international contracts, and that and a lot of them are like transnational elites, so like the Bijos who who who's rich all over the Caribbean, right? And these people have like U.S visas and or u.s uh, you know residents and citizenship and so they live in florida <laughs> and mm, stuff like yeah. that right so you have them but then you have that you know that 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 political class you know that's willing to sell you know it's 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 loyalty to the highest bidder and so you do you know so you do have like this what i this is that's the comprador bourgeoisie who mm. who's sitting there allowing you know allowing themselves to be used um, in the imperial machinations, and so you have that. You know the 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 the, the, the elite, the, the political the political opposition. There's also the bourgeois opposition, which you know is also fighting each other. But that's not that's a, all. Those together are small, small group compared right. to um, compared to the large masses. And what's telling is during um, Jovenel Moise's uh, funeral in northern Haiti. Um, how the U.S. delegation had to be rushed out of there because people were so angry with them because they're like, nothing happens in Haiti without the knowledge and support of the U.S. government, right? So everybody thinks that the U.S. Has, is, is part of this. Uh, and, and, and they think they're, you know, either they knew about it and allowed it to happen or they had a clear, clear uh, role in, in this assassination. Right. And so maybe that's a good transition into... I guess just figuring, talking through what we know about what happened with the assassination. And we don't seem to know that much, but, uh, I think I'm sure that you have an idea of at least the different narratives. And so maybe first to start with, what do you think? What have you been able to gather about what happened? And then maybe after that, we can talk a little bit about the official narrative and how that might differ. Right. Well, I think this was an internal, I think this was a, a, a fight among the elite. Um, I think I think that there, there was a way that um, the party itself, the PTHK party, 
um, Moise, you know, fell out of favor with some of the oligarchy. And, um, you know, people are saying that, you know, for example, he had threatened to seize um, property of, of like Reginald Boulos, one of these oligarchy. And, um, and, and also, I, I, he wasn't doing what he was supposed to do. And I think that, you know, he was taught, he started towards the end of his life, he was talking about stopping people's contracts, you know, these people who were making all this money off of contracts. And so I think this was, uh, and also I think because he was not popular, and I think he was, he was becoming a liability for the so-called international community, which is, of course, you know, who, uh, it's the U.S., the U.N., and, and the core group. And so, and so it's a combination of things. I think so the party itself, I think, um, you know, fractured and didn't want him in. But I also think it, it served the purposes of the international community to get rid of him. I do think there's no way any of this could have happened if it wasn't um, bankrolled by some very wealthy people. So right. that's what's not coming out of this. Yeah, so what's the, what was the story early on? Everyone was talking about this kind of mystery doctor from Florida. Oh, Florida who's... That seemed a little suspicious. Yeah, and I, I think he, he probably felt like he could be president. They probably, he was probably unwitting. I do think he didn't have any money, though. He was a broke doctor, minister living in Florida <laughs> that they probably thought, you know, he thought that if once they got rid of Moise, they would install him because that's what the U.S. has done, you know, just bring in somebody from the U.S. and right. install them as, as, as prime minister like they did with Aristide. They brought in Yuri Latour, you know, they brought in this guy, Gerald Latour, mm -hmm. too, and installed him, you know, from Florida. He hadn't lived in Haiti for like 40 years. So, so, right. so he thought, but I do think we, I, I, I wonder if we'll ever find out who the mastermind is or who paid um, for this, because that's, that's where, that's where we'll know the reason, the full reason. Yeah. I mean, we all speculated, but there's, every, what everybody knows is that this was a master, there's, there are masterminds behind this that are able to pay 20 something Colombians um, you know, three, four thousand dollars each a month to case out and, and, and be in Haiti. What's coming out now, though, is that and then the Colombian press has been on this, is that apparently five to seven, which makes sense if you think about assassinations, because, you know, you don't need mm -hmm. 26 people for an assassination. Right. So, you know, they're saying like these Colombians thought they were arresting him, like doing a citizen's arrest. But they're saying like five to six of them knew what was going on. Uh, and those are the ones that are still missing. They extracted them out of there. Um, sure you know, immediately. So we don't know, we don't know where it's going. What I do think is problematic is the fact that Moise's wife has given more interviews to the foreign press than she has to the police. <laughs> and then, right? So she's everywhere, right? Which to me is suspicious to a lot of Haitians, right? But the, the, the thing is, is, is that um, you have the FBI coming in and leaving with all this evidence. You have the Haitian police chief, which people don't uh, people don't like because he's, you know, he comes from like the post Aristide. Um, you know, he was the one, he was a very brutal police chief, and people were very upset that he was actually made police chief in the fall of 2020. People mm -hmm. don't trust him because they're saying, well, how is it that this guy had like 21 security people around him on the night of his death, and none of them were killed, none of them were hurt, right? And so, so people are still wondering how did this assassination happen where none of his security team. Um, were involved or, 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 or hurt. And so, so there's a lot of speculation, but I do think this was an internal thing. I do think there's some very wealthy people that bankrolled it. And, mm -hmm. and I don't think we'll ever, unless we catch the bankrolling, you know, there are going to be a lot of scapegoats. And I don't think we'll ever mm -hmm. know the truth. And is there a clean, so I guess this is a two-part question. Is there a clear official narrative about what happens? And do Haitians on the ground believe that? Well, well, Haitian on the ground, I don't think, believe any of these narratives. And so, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> so part of that is, you know, I get I get all these, you know, if you watch, you watch enough um, Haitian um, political news, it's just a discussion. It's like the focus is on who funded this operation. Right. Um, a lot of people think that the Colombians, you know, which was there, they believe that the Colombians, there are some Colombians or all the Colombians were part of it. But the thing is, who led the Colombians to, to, to come to Haiti and kill the president, right? And so, mm -hmm. and so the official narrative is like these Colombians, um, you know, came in. They were funded by some groups that this this hapless minister was, you know, was in meetings and 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 behind it. And then some of Moise's, uh, so they're saying some of these Moise's uh, political opponents, like these judges that he fired back in February. 
you know, I forgot her name, this woman, that there's a, 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 a warrant for arrest that he fired. Right. They're saying that they're the ones that bankrolled it. And people don't believe that. And they're thinking they're using scapegoats to hide the, the, the money um, behind the assassination. Mm-hmm. And people don't put it past the FBI either, especially since a lot of these killers were, you know, were like, um, it's being revealed that they were like DEA, um, they were uh, witnesses um, for, mm-hmm. for, you know, they were for trained the by some yeah. Yeah, informants for the DEA. And so people are like, the U.S. is all up in this. <laughs> and so mm-hmm. that's the other, that's the other thing I think that's coming out. Yeah. And I think... And it's interesting because that's another thing. And the, there's no there's no solid evidence that the U.S. had anything to do with the coup. But I, what I think people miss is a lot of the theory, the thinking that might sound conspiratorial from our perspective does make sense when you look at. And I hope we've demonstrated with the with the longer sweep of Haitian history, the the scale of intervention is really is really kind of hard to get your mind around. And and the fact that we've got these rumors going around about you know, potential U.S. involvement is is really not surprising given that context. Oh, no, not at all. I mean, if I told you that Hillary Clinton flew in and got in a room and threatened the sitting president of a sovereign nation with exile if they didn't allow their own candidate to be in the runoff of an election, people would not believe me. If it wasn't for the WikiLeaks files that explicitly state these things. I mean, WikiLeaks files also demonstrate, for example, some of the key reporters are in cahoots with the U.S., right? You know, private That's emails true. of like, you know, the, the, you know, like one of the reporters from the Miami Herald, you know, she's mm-hmm. emailing, you know, Hillary Clinton's advisor about, you know, what's going to happen and sending them inside, uh, um, inside, you know, data. So, so you, the scale of corruption, if it wasn't for like the release of these diplomatic and secret cables, we would, we know they're happening. But this, the case will actually demonstrate that for us. And one of the, you know, and I have to promote this, you know, Kim Ives um, of ITD Belte and, and Ansel Hertz did a whole, in the nation, did a whole series on WikiLeaks and Haiti showing the depth of intervention and influence um, in, 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 in Haiti that where they show the cables, they read through the cables and they tell you all of that. So if people want to do that, they might want to check out the WikiLeaks and Haiti series out of the nation. Yeah, definitely. And I'll link to that on the bloggingheads.tv website version of this conversation. Um, and another thing I think is interesting, I was just prepping for this interview and actually just recently saw this, was that um, among the other notable things, and just to demonstrate the level of, of importance that the Haitian elite give to the U.S., is that a lot of them scrambled after the assassination to hire lobbyists in D.C. Um, and I'm curious what you think about that. Well, it, that should tell you everything, right? And, and so including Reginald Boulos, who a lot of people are blaming for bankrolling this, you know, that they were scrambling even before the, the assassination, paying thousands of dollars to lobbyists to talk to Washington. So what does that tell you that whether they see the seat of what other sovereign nation goes to another nation to lobby that nation's government so that they can have a role in, 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 in Haiti? So that tells you where the, the seat of power in Haiti is not in Haiti. You know, Haiti's a colony mm-hmm. as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, it is. It is really interesting. And yeah, I mean, I, I think that's another thing where I just kind of want to hammer it home because it's just it, it is surprising to a lot of people the extent. And I remember there was some um, Jonathan uh, Katz wrote yes. a thing about this recently in a, in a Substack letter after he had written something about just he he wanted to provide this historical narrative about Haiti and it was a piece that was commissioned by a major paper that ended up getting rejected and then he published somewhere else in part because the history it really does sound a little crazy <laughs> it does but uh, but so much of it is, is is true and it's it's very important to get out there yeah yeah de- definitely definitely yeah, and so a couple more topics before we close. I'd say just two two key things. The first is there have been a lot of calls for elections. And in theory, elections are supposed to be held, I guess, later this year. Um, and as you noted, the, the Rush 2010 elections were unpopular and helps lead to a lot of the problems that we've seen today. So do you think that it's a good idea for there to be elections in the near future or are there, you know, credible figures that could help the transition back to democratic governance? 
Okay, so before I answer that, I forgot to say that, so there's a, there's a whole group, there's a Haitian civil society group that's been meeting since the assassination to say we want a Haitian solution to our Haitian problem that the U.S. government and the OAS in the courtroom completely bypassed. In fact, July 17th, they were having their huge conference. And, you know, they're, you know, they're a mixed bag of different people, mm -hmm. communities, you know, but political elites, you know, that say we don't want outsiders to decide who our next president or next prime minister is going to be. On the day that they're meeting, the core group releases that Alio Henri would be the new prime minister oh. and is call out his government and, and, and list his cabinet in, 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 um, on the Tuesday after. So that already tells us, and then these, you know, the group is completely silent. And so they're, you know, they're protesting Twitter, whatever, and they're saying they basically undercut them, right? And one of the, one of the key reasons why Moïse was so unpopular was that he was trying to force elections to change the constitution so that he would give the executive more power. And then Haiti's constitution has it that a president cannot run more than once. Like you cannot, there's only one term. You can run again, but you have to wait for at least another term to go by before you run again. Mm -hmm. And this is to stop, you know, the, the history of dictatorships, right? So, sure. so he was trying to change the constitution, trying to open up, you know, uh, uh, the thing for foreign access to, to different things. Oh, I, on a quick aside, it, <laughs> during the 15, 1915 occupation, the U.S., Franklin, is it? No, is it? Yeah, FDR rewrote Haiti's constitution. In the, he rewrote Haiti's... What the, year would this have been? 1915. 19, so 19. Wilson, maybe. Was it Wilson? No, well, no, not the president. He was he was not president at the time. Oh, was, uh, interesting. Okay. Yeah, so he wrote... I have to look this up. But he rewrote Haiti's constitution. He right. says, you know, I'm proud of it. It's a good constitution. And the reason why that's important is because... After slavery, after the revolution, the Haitian constitution specifically said no foreigners could own land in Haiti, right? So in rewriting the constitution, it removed that clause from the Haitian constitution, right? That allowed foreigners to own things and, and remove the people, the peasants from their land. So one of the things that Martelly and Moise were doing was giving swaths of land, the and most recent to one of the rich families, a, a pay you know, 25,000 acres, I think, you know, uh, or a, a lot of acres will remove the farmers so that Coca-Cola can go in a deal with them to grow stevia, right? The sweetener, right? So, so there's that. So anyway, so people were really upset that he was trying to change the constitution and they said, we could not have, a, we could not have elections under an undemocratic regime, right? Um, Moise was ruling by, by decree. There was no parliament, there was no, you know, uh, the, the, the election commission he appointed, he appointed the, he appointed everyone. And so people are saying, we're not having elections until we figure out a democratic way out of this. And whatever mm -hmm. Moise was, was putting in place is not democratic. There's no, there's no, there's no legal or political basis for it. So when the U.S. and the U.N. established this new, which is what they did, against uh, 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 against the voices, you know, leaving out the voices of the majority of the political elite in Haiti, the, the political groups of Haiti fighting for Haitian solutions. Uh, Ariel Henry, who also was brought in after Aristide as the council uh, of Haitians that, you know, that helped the foreigners run in Haiti, he, his cabinet is actually the same political party, except for one or two people. And the people are saying there's no change. It's like, it's like, it's like PTHK without Moise. And people are saying it is still an undemocratic formation, and so there cannot be a, there cannot be elections when you have a prime minister that wasn't elected, when you have a government that wasn't elected, and it's the same people from the Moise's people. Now, for the U.S., they want to have an election to show the veneer that you know once they have the election, they can you know not deal with Haiti. Haiti's quote unquote stabilized, right? Mm -hmm. So it makes them look good to what I have to push for these elections, but I think when we might have more military intervention might be when people protest the forcing of elections uh, onto the people. People people want their own solutions and they don't want the solutions to begin with backroom deals with the U.S. and, and, and a group of comprador bourgeoisie. Right. And so your view is that there is no way to have a legitimate election no. given the current makeup of the government. There's not a legitimate government. Right. And that's the view of 
of, of most That's the view of the opposition, that the political opposition, most of the people. In fact, um, you know, back in 2000, um, back in February, when Moise refused to step down, you know, the, the opposition actually had put out a whole new document um, with a whole, say, okay, we're going to have an interim government. You know, they picked a leader um, who was a judge, a sitting judge at the time. And what Moise did, they, he fired the, the judge and all the judges. And, and, and so, so, so the, the, the local political uh, uh, opposition, have, uh, they have a, a plan. They have a plan to bring back legitimacy but that's been completely shut out and bypassed by the international community. And so no one's going to want these, and they're going to see these elections as illegitimate as Martellis and Moises. And so given all of that, um, I guess to close out, I would just ask you maybe just to speculate a little bit on what you think is going to happen over at least these next few months. Um, so we've got this real acute political crisis. We've got a contested government. We've got a recently assassinate, assassinated president. We've got obviously constantly changing things. There's a lot of talk of, I understand there to be significant kind of paramilitary organizations. So in that kind of confusing canvas, I guess, what do you see happening over the next few months? Uh, and do you see a resolution to this crisis in the, in the near future? I don't see a resolution if the international community is still involved, to be honest. I, I, I think people know this. And if the international community, and by this I mean because it's not the entire international community, I mean the U.S. and the OAS, OAS mm -hmm. and the U.N., which are, you know, all working in lockstep, walking in lockstep. I think, you know, the, what's, what's going to be used is the gang situation as pretext for um, stabilize, uh, for for a military presence, um, you know, part of the things is um, there are these gangs that are emerging and calling themselves revolutionary. Um, I do think what's happened is Moise has become some kind of a martyr um, in Haiti, um, where he wasn't like before. But people, even people who didn't like him, were just disgusted at the fact that they sent foreigners to massacre this man, and right. and 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 the way that they killed him was just terrible. And so even people who were did not like him or just completely disgusted by it. And so I think, I think unless the international community steps back and pretends to allow the opposition to come up with its own uh, solution, um, whatever solution that the international community backs is going to backfire. If it's not now, if it's, it, it's going to be later. I do think uh, the, 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 the armed um, groups um, that are there um, there's a there's an awakening that's happening that's really interesting in that they're saying that their problem is the oligarchy and the foreigners. And they're blaming the oligarchy and the foreigners for the death of Moise, and he's become a martyr for a lot of them. And so that remains to be seen. I do think we are going to see a military um, footprint, um, well, not not a, but more military interventions in the next few months um, as a pretext to force elections. And I think they are going to force elections and they might convince some of the um, opposition to join in, to give veneer of, of legitimacy. But I think the political crisis is going to go on for uh, a while. But then, we, but then again, my hope is, you know, we thought slavery was going to go on for a long time and, here, and then you had the Haitian Revolution. So the only hope is that with Haiti, you never know. <laughs> you never know when the people are just going to be like, it's enough. And something happens and, and, and it destroys the current, the current um, system. Well, there's no better place to end than on a hopeful note, even if it was preceded by a lot of uh, less than hopeful analysis. Right. Uh, so we'll go ahead and end there. But I want to thank you again so much, Shamima, for joining me. And I uh, really appreciate you taking the time. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Of course.